In this lesson, we're continuing our discussion of using calculus to perform optimizations. This is actually very similar to the previous lesson we did where I looked at optimizing distances because now I'm going to be optimizing time. And in the case of motion, time and distance are actually related to each other. So first of all, let's take a look at the scenario, make sure we got at least a one reading to make sure we understand it. We've got an amphibious vehicle. I found a pretty good illustration of this. We've got a vehicle here. It's capable of traveling on the water and then it's also got wheels that allow it to travel along land. This vehicle is 16 kilometers away from the beach, meaning straight out into the water from the beach. The operator's home is 20 kilometers down the shore from where we are in the water right now. To get back home, the vehicle can travel at a speed of 30 kilometers per hour in the water and 70 kilometers per hour on land. And that's pretty typical. Generally, their speeds in the water are quite a bit less than what they would be on land. So consider some possible paths they could take to get home and the time required for each path. And then determine the route taken to minimize their travel time. And as always, a diagram is going to help here. Another thing that might help is just a reminder the relationship between distance, velocity, and time, or distance, speed, and time. In this case, we're not talking about direction, so it's just distance, speed, and time. Um, the easiest way I find to remember that is this one, just d is equal to vt. It's just a multiplication, dvt. Um, we're going to make use of this. What's more interesting to us is actually, because we are interested in time, we're going to be interested in the rearrangement of this formula so that time is equal to distance divided by speed. So we're going to make use of that. And the first thing I'm going to do is take my hint here and get a diagram. And then we're going to consider some scenarios to describe this. So here is the beach up here. Here is the location of the uh, amphibious vehicle to start. As you can see, it is 16 kilometers away. And that's 16 kilometers away meaning it's at a right angle to the beach, 16 kilometers away, and 20 kilometers down the beach. So under those circumstances, what are, first of all, what are some possible paths that we might take? We might go straight along this diagonal. And if we did that, that would be the hypotenuse. If we were to go straight along that diagonal, then this distance, so um, if we went along this diagonal, that would mean we were doing only our traveling in the water. So our distance traveled in the water. So let's, I'm going to mark that as a one, as if that's, I'm going to land here. So I'm going to land right at my final location. So for scenario one, my distance traveled in the water, well, that's just going to be the Pythagorean theorem. That's going to be 16 squared plus. 20 squared and I'm not going to I'm not going to do the calculations just yet I just want to kind of lay this out for you um, and in this case my distance traveled on land well I won't have traveled on land at all so my distance will be zero but we're not actually interested in distances traveled we're interested in times so if my distance traveled in the water is this then that means that my time traveled in the water and again, remember the rearrangement I said for this, which is that t is equal to v divided by d. So the time travel in the water is going to be the speed in the water, which was 30, divided by the distance traveled in the water, which was square root of 16 squared plus 20 squared. The time traveled while on land, of course, is 0, because the distance on land is zero. Um, so sorry I just did that backwards didn't I? t is equal to d divided by v. My apologies for that. So t is equal to distance divided by speed. So this is going to be the square root of 16 squared plus 20 squared all divided by the speed. The speed in the water is 30. And that's where I caught myself there because I realized the time on land is the distance on land, which is 0, divided by the speed on land, which is 70. But of course, in this case, that just works out to be 0 anyway. There's no calculation to be done. 
So now, what is my time in the water? I have uh, 16 squared plus 20 squared. And I take the square root of that thing. And I divide it by 30. And I end up with, so that means my total time, so t total, is just going to be 0 0.8 five four approximately plus zero which of course is equal to zero point eight five four so that's one of my options point eight five four hours what is another option well I don't have to I don't have to land right at my location what and I'm gonna choose an easier option now which is what if I were to go here instead of going straight to the location what if I were to go straight to the beach and then straight down the beach? That's actually easier. I could have started with that, but I mean, it doesn't matter. A Pythagorean calculation is not going to throw us off our game. So now for scenario two, my distance in the water is just the 16 kilometers that I would have to go straight down to get to the beach. My distance on land is equal to 20 kilometers which is going along the beach. And then from here, I can find my time in the water. And I'll do the calculation right, right away this time. The time in the water is the distance in the water divided by the speed in the water. And the time on land, so I'm just going to remind you here, I'm using t is equal to d divided by v. The time on land is equal to the distance on land divided by the speed on land. So the time total is going to be the sum of those two. And because of this answer, I know that I'm not going to, there's no point in worrying about maintaining exact values. So I'm just going to go ahead and use my calculator for this whole thing. And I end up with approximately 0.8 one nine now that may be a bit of a surprising result for some people if you take a look at that a straight line which we know the shortest distance between any two points is a straight line but because of the differences in the speeds that I can travel in water or on land it turns out to actually be faster to go straight to the beach and then down the beach now this begs the question and this is where the calculus is going to come in which is, is there a spot along the beach that is some ideal combination of driving in the water compared to driving on land? That's what we're looking for here. And so we are going to try to vary this. Now, as I've been doing for some of the questions in this unit, I actually have prepared, actually, I think that's the one I want to see. I've prepared a couple of slides in GeoGebra to illustrate this. So, for example, in this case, let's go to the first scenario we looked at, which was to go straight from start to finish along the water. And so my distance in the water was 25.61 kilometers. Did I actually calculate the distance or did I just go straight to... No, I didn't show that. That's this part. The, square, the 16 squared plus 20 squared all square rooted. That's this, 25.61. My distance on land, I don't travel on land here, so the distance is 0, which means my total distance is 25.61. If I go back this way, for example, well, let's go all the way back here to the origin. My distance in the water is going to be 16. My distance on the land is going to be 20. And my total distance is 36. That's considerably larger than the 25.61 that we had before. And then there's everything in between. As I slide this, let's say, to halfway, that's 10 kilometers down the beach, if I can get it to right on there. So now I've got a distance on land, which is this red line of 10. I've got this distance in the water, which is this blue line of 18.87. And then they add up to 28.87. But as I mentioned, the minimal time, not the minimal time, but we can get a better time by going here a longer distance than we can by going the shortest distance. So now we get into the question of, well, what is the best place to land our watercraft? So let's go once again. Let's go down here to the going directly to our destination. 
the time in the water works out to be 0.85 hours along the diagonal. We spent no time on land, which means our total travel time was 0.85. If I go to here, straight to the beach, my time in the water is 0.53 hours. That's how long it takes to do this 16 kilometers. My time on land, it's 20 kilometers, but I'm actually moving at 70 kilometers per hour. So I'm able to cover that land distance in 0.29 hours. And the total for that is 0.82 hours. So I actually end up with a better total than this 0.8, I think it was 0.85. Now let's just, I'm going to slowly scroll through here. We go down to 0 0.84, 0 0.83, 0 0.82, and you, oh, look at that. We're below 0 0.82, which means there's a better, an even better improvement. 0 0.79, 0 0.78, 0 0.77, and it looks like we're going to bottom out at 0 0.77. Now I expect to go back up to 0 0.78 now, and yep, and 0 0.79 and we get up to 0 0.8 and then back to 0 0.82, which was going straight to the beach. So optimization is we're now looking to find, well, where in here? Now, I haven't shown enough decimal places for us to do any better than kind of just this general range of where we should go. But we know we should go in here somewhere. So now we're going to use the calculus to determine that. So the way I set up this problem, it's, it's not just as easy as drawing a picture. So the way I'm going to set up this problem is I'm going to choose some sort of hypothetical landing point on the beach. And I will just go ahead and draw my... So there is my first part of the trip. And there is the second part of the trip. So let's break those two parts up. I'm going to call this distance from here to my landing point... I'm just going to go ahead and call that x. This value is 16, right? That We already know that. The distance from our start to the beach is 16. I'm going to break this beach distance up between x, and if that's x, then what's left here has to be 20 minus x. That's that part that's left over. Now, why is this important? Well, the first thing is, this part is my distance on land. So my distance on land is always going to be 20 minus x, which means my time on land is going to be 20 minus x over the speed on land, which is 70. Now I didn't mention this before, but I'm going to mention it now, which is you do have to make sure your units all match up. In this case, all of the distances were given in kilometers. All of the speeds were given in kilometers per hour. It is really important. One of the things we tend to do in mathematics is we don't write out the units in our calculations. You can only do that, or the assumption in doing that, is that you've made sure all the units line up beforehand. So the only reason you can get away with not writing those units out is because you've checked to make sure the units all match. So if we had meters and kilometers, we have to make a conversion. We have to pick one of those. Okay, so that covers the distance on land, which in turn tells us the time on land. More complicated is this one, which is, well, it's not the distance part. This is our distance in the water. And just like we did before, this one's going to be done using the Pythagorean theorem. We have a right angle here. So it's going to be, x squared plus 16 squared, all square rooted. And so that means that our time in the water is the distance in the water divided by the speed in the water, which was 30, or is 30. So now that we have those two values, we can actually get started on our optimization. And so just to write out a, an expression, our to total time, which I'm just going to write, well, you know what, for now I'm just going to write this, I'll say total time is equal to the time in the water, x squared plus, and I'm going to change 16 squared, I'm just going to change that to 256, that's a simple enough one to do, over 30, plus 20 minus x over 70. Now it doesn't actually matter, um, 20 minus x or 
well, x minus 20. I just want to show you an, another way that you could write this. You could write this as x squared plus 256 over 30. If you wanted to, you could change this to minus x minus 20 over 70. What I've done essentially is I factored out a negative 1, which I've put here. Do you take this step? That's a comfort thing. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and work with it as is. I'm going to work with it from there. But that's just, you might see it that way and want to write it that way. So what I'm going to do, I'm actually uh, just, try, I don't want things to get too crowded here. So I'm going to take that and I'm going to copy it. And I'm going to open up another page so that I can have a nice clean page to work with and that no single page. I don't want any of these pages to get too long for when I post these online. Now, the other thing I'm going to do here, I'm going to make another change here. This is the time, but notice the only variable here is x. So this is actually t of x. That's no different than f of x. If we are looking to optimize time, we need to take the derivative of this. So I'm going to now take t prime of x and I end up with, well, like, you know what? I realize I should probably make one more step before I take t prime of x, is to write this in a form that might be a little bit more useful to us. Instead of writing this over 30, I'm going to write this as 1 over 30 times x squared plus 256 to the 1 half. And this other one I can just leave as is, or if I want to be consistent with what I've done there, I'm going to write that just as 1 over 70 times 20 minus x. Just recognizing that dividing by 70 is the same as multiplying by 1 over 70. This is just a multiplier. When we take the derivative, it won't matter. I don't want you to think you have to use the quotient rule for these things. t prime of x is equal to, so this is just a constant, 1 over 30, stays there. I bring down this 1 half, x squared plus 256, it's the, to the negative one half now as I subtract one. And then I apply the chain rule, which means multiply by 2x. This one's actually much simpler. It's going to be plus one over 70. And then derivative of the inside there is just equal to negative one. Some simplification. I see a two here and a two here, so I can divide that out. So I end up with, uh, let's see, x, oh, let's go back to my original color. I end up with, in the numerator, I end up with just x, and in the denominator, I end up it with 30 times x squared plus 256 to the 1 half. Uh, that would be up to you if you wanted to write it that way, or you could write it as a radical again. And over here, I just end up with minus 1 over 70. So no additional simplification that I can do there. Now I am going to, I'm trying to optimize this. I'm trying to find a maximum or a minimum. So I'm going to set this equal to 0. So that's my next step, is I'm going to set t prime of x equal to 0. And so from there, I get 0 equals. Now, I'm going to do a common denominator here because in its current form, it's not particularly useful to me. So what do I need to do to get a common denominator? Uh, my denominator is going to be, I've got 30 and I've got 70, which means actually the 10's already there. So actually what I need to do is just multiply top and bottom by 7. So I get 210 x squared plus 256 to the 1 half, or I'm going to write that now. Well, I'll leave it that way. That's uh, It's going to be a square root, though. So what did I have to multiply this by? That numerator got multiplied by 7, so that becomes 7x. And uh, maybe I didn't need to do a common denominator here, but that's fine. And then this one gets multiplied minus 3 times... Uh, let's see, x squared plus 256 to the 1 half. So that's where I end up with this, and this is equal to 0. But the only way I can get this expression equal to 0 is if the denominator, well, it's not going to contribute here. Only the numerator contributes. If I cross multiply, the denominator just multiplies into the 0. So what I end up with is 
0 is equal to 7x minus 3. And I think visually for solving this, I'm actually going to switch back to radical notation. Then I'm going to I bring this over to the other side. So I end up with 3 square root of x squared plus 256 is equal to 7x. And I can square both sides. So that means that squared is equal to that thing squared. And that's going to let me get rid of that radical. So I end up here with 9 times x squared plus 256 is equal to 49 x squared. And if I multiply that out, I get 9x squared plus, and 9 times 256 is 2304. Don't worry, I didn't do that in my head. And actually, that's not a terrible one to do in your head. And that's 49x squared. And so I end up with 2304 is equal to 40x squared. And so from there, I end up with x is equal to plus or minus the square root of 2304 divided by 40. And that's not really a meaningful answer, so I'm actually going to figure out what those values would be. And actually, before I do that, I want to go back to, so I've got those two values, but notice that one of those values is positive and one is negative. Let's see, does a negative value make any sense at all? That would mean that we're actually going to go further away from shore. We're going to increase, sorry, we're going to go further away. We're increasing the distance along land. That can't possibly make any sense. That doesn't make any sense at all. So we're going to discard that. So I'll say that here. So I'm going to discard x less than 0 uh, because that is moving further away. That's the same thing as if I actually started to move. It would never make sense for the first movement that I made to actually be to increase my distance away from the beach. Same kind of reasoning. Okay, so now that we've done that, let's move on. I'm just going to once again go to a blank page. So we ended up with x x is equal to plus or minus, but it's not plus or minus, so we end up with x is equal to the square root of 2304 divided by 40. So x was approximately equal to 7.589. 7.589. Now you have to remember that we looked at this in GeoGebra, but we actually don't know this for certain until we've tested the endpoints algebraically. Now it turns out I did do that here, didn't I? I checked my times and, no, where was I? Previous page. So I ended up with 0.854. And what did this match up with? That matched up with x equal to 20, the full distance. And then I also checked when there was no distance on the beach. That was 0.819. So I've actually already checked my, what are known as my endpoints. So I'll just make a note of that here. So I, so I have to check t of 7.589. So that means I... I land 7.589 kilometers along the beach. And that works out to be approximately 0 0.768. That's our time in hours. I'm just going to make a note of it here. I wouldn't normally write this. I just want you to understand that this is hours and this is the distance down the beach. Okay, now we also have to test our what are known as our uh, boundaries or bo boundary conditions or endpoints. And so that would be x equals 0 
and x equal 20. So t at 0, we've already figured that one out before. So t at 0 was, if I just take a look at my equation again, t at 0 would be square root of 256. So that one was 16 over 30 plus 20 over 70. And that was equal to 0. Point, uh, what did that work out to be? 16 divided by 30 plus 20 divided by 70. That was 0. 0.819. And then t at 20 was equal to the square root of 16 squared plus 20 squared over 30. And that worked out to be 16 squared plus 20 squared. And then we square root that, divide by 30, and we end up with 0 0.854. 0 0.854. And so therefore, the minimum time is when landing, and what did I say? 7.6 kilometers along the beach. And that's from where we're starting. So for example, just to redraw our diagram, here we are to start, here's where we want to finish, and we want to land 7.6 kilometers. So that's where we want to land. As you can see, that was a long time, long problem for one problem, a lot of, a lot of explanation, a lot of algebra to do. And so that is it for this one. We've just got some uh, questions to work on from the handout.